Hello, and thank you for being here with us. You're invited to join us every Sunday here in person at 9 and 11 a.m. or live online at 9 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube. Whether in person or from home, we are so thankful for every opportunity we have to worship with you. God is doing incredible things here at Word of Life, and we are so honored that you chose to be a part of that. Yeah, you guys feeling good tonight? Woo! I, t- I tell you what, uh, just being in the back, just during worship, um, man, you guys are just, you guys are excited tonight. It's awesome. Uh, well, I'm excited, so that you know what that means. Uh, camera guys, look out, because here we go. Um, they're like, oh, man. Oh, I just lost a marker. That's all right. Um, it's so good. Well, I tell you what, I, I, it's been awesome just as... Um, our pastor and my father just, just said, he, we, we preach things, in a sense, to ourselves um, first, and it's, and it's just awesome, you know what I mean, to never wanna just, just preach to preach, you know, never wanna just study to preach a message. Um, I, I've just come to the place to where I, I wanna study, and I, wanna, I just wanna learn, and I wanna grow, and I wanna get in here. Uh, to know him. And that's just because when we know him out of the abundance of the heart, you know, we speak, we move, we, you know, life and death are in the power of what? The tongue, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, you know? And, um, and I just think about that, um, what Pastor was talking about with uh, just being that light, being able to do and spread the gospel, whether it's through finances, whether it's just, um, Especially, man, that is so powerful in Acts chapter nine with just laying on our hands and just seeing the power of God move. And I thought about this. This is so huge because, um, what was it? It was Tabitha. Was that what it was? It was Tabitha who was raised from the dead. And um, Dorcas, hey, thank you for not naming me that, you know? That would have been terrible, you know? I would have had to, go, I would have had to get like really tough in school, you know? <laughs> Um, but, but so, uh, but it was Tabitha, right? Yeah. So, um, but when Tabitha was, was there, I thought about that to where the ladies were all showing the coats that she had made. They were showing things. And I think about that in a sense, and I, I know Peter walked in the room, but in a sense, when Jesus walked into the room through Peter, you know, you are the, you, you are the hands and feet, Holy Spirit in you. And I, be, I truly believe that when, when we reach, that's why when we lay hands on people, that's why when we speak, you know, it, it's Holy Spirit speaking through us. It's Holy Spirit laying hands on through us, through our shell. And, uh, and I, in that moment, you know, when Peter walked in, they were sh- like, oh, look at this code. They, they, rem- they were remembering things that, that were, okay? But I, I believe that, you know, when Jesus walks into the room, he, he, he sees things as they are, not as they were, you know, and that's so amazing. And I think we can get caught up so much in, in something happens and our mind is immediately drawn back to another point in time to where something failed, something didn't work out, a story that we heard that it didn't work out for them. And I think of that so much when it comes to sickness, um, to where, you know, maybe you're not feeling well, maybe something's going on, maybe you get a bad doctor's report and then he, immediately you're like, oh, well, you know, it, how the enemy works. The, the enemy, he's, he's a jerk and he's just dumb, you know? And uh, he'll, he'll come up and it, the moment something happens, somebody will come up to you that maybe like, that doesn't even like never talks to you about anything like that. And will just like say something that just like really kind of hits on that point. Maybe it's, maybe it's a bad doctor's report. And then all of a sudden, oh, I just had an aunt so-and-so or an uncle this or the, you know, that, oh, well, they died from that. And then all of a sudden how the enemy starts to work, how the enemy tries to plant those seeds to get you to doubt God's word and who he has called you to be, God's word and what he has promised over your life. And I think of that to where all of a sudden we start to think about something other than God's word. And, and in that moment, it's just like, no, 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 I am not, I am taking that thought captive. I am not allowing that to be planted in my mind. I'm not going to move forward in this story about somebody else. I'm going to move forward in the story about Jesus who totally paid my price, that paid for my sickness, that paid for my disease, and I'm going to step into every single thing that he paid for. That's just period. That's just what it is. You know, and I thought about that in that story, and that's amazing. And that's kind of what we've been talking about 
when, when I brought up about David and Goliath and the Israelites as they're, as, as they're camped and, and, and here is in the Valley of Elah and here is, here's Goliath that's taunting the Israelites and David shows up and it's like, wait a minute, like who's this dude? Like what right do you have? You, you can't be saying those things because we are the one with the covenant. And, and, and it just pulls in so much again to where our minds get drifted because you had the Israelite army here that was divided and cowering in fear and you have David who was undivided and running forward in faith. And we talked in Proverbs 2, for only the godly will live in the land and those with integrity will remain in it. Those with integrity, it, it takes something different than the world's course to have true godly integrity. And, and I brought up this question is not so much do you have integrity in the world's definition of like, hey, are you a good person? But does God's word have integrity within you? When storms come, does your life stand? When something happens, what is your foundation? What are you, what are you standing on? When, when something comes along, and I think that was so key in just how Holy Spirit puts those things together because it's not focusing on what was and everything over here. It's focusing on what is, and that's the promise of God that never fails, that is the same yesterday, today, and forever, period. And so you have David here that shows up on the scene that he's like, wait a minute, I have a promise. My foundation is in fear. He was looking around and an entire camp, including family members and probably friends, that in a sense that their foundation was fear, but his foundation was faith because faith doesn't come from your head. They were feeding on the fear of Goliath and the fear of this enemy. So many of us, Feed on the fear of the enemy. Feed on the fear of what's happening, happening around us. And you know, every, it's just an avenue. It's just a container. The things that are happening in the world, the things that happen around us, it's just a container that the enemy is using to plant those things. And I say that, wait a minute, if the enemy is gonna try to use those containers and those outlets, wait a minute, I am God's vessel. I am a temple. I am a container. If the enemy is going to try to do that, I'm going to one up him because I am full of all of heaven. And, and as he's trying to create these outlets, I'm going to be the outlet for heaven to invade earth. And so that's exactly what David was doing here. Because they were feeding on fear and feeding on fear. And we, we have a tendency so much to feed on fear. And I think even when we have to be so careful because even when we're listening to, in a sense, Christian things, Christian news sources and Christian media and even teaching cannot replace God's word. It needs to complement it. But we cannot take even even other pastors and, and especially any kind of news source. I don't, I don't care if it's Christian, but even if it is, like it doesn't matter. We cannot take these things. They are not God's word. They should be speaking God's word, but that's what the Bible says. It's like, wait a minute, no, 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 prove all things in here. It needs to line up with this. It needs to complement this. If, if, God's, if it's not complementing what God has already spoken, wait a minute, I don't need it in my life. And so when they're feeding on fear, and I, again, I think so many of us do that, we'll feed on these sources, and it's like, wait a minute, wait, God, what do you say? And the Israelites were feeding on that, and as, as they were feeding on that fear, and feeding on that fear, and feeding on that fear, you are what you eat, right? A lot of you, some of you don't like that. You are what you eat. And so as they were feeding on that fear, they, be, they, they allowed that spirit of fear to become their identity. But here was David who was in the shepherd's field and he was worshiping and he was, he was surrendering himself to God and realized that faith doesn't come from our head, it comes from our heart. Faith doesn't come from striving in our own works. Faith is a result of one thing and that's surrender. 
And we got a good bit through surrender last week, but I just kind of want to wrap up a few things because I, I, th I think it's the hardest thing to do is, is if you don't surrender, there is no other point of going forward. You can't, you, you, you can't, you can't flow, you can't move. There, there is nothing else until you let go, until the definition is to abandon oneself entirely. And why don't we wanna let go? Because it's fear driving us. Faith runs forward. Fear hides back. We don't wanna let go of our health or our finances or or our relationships, or we don't wanna, we don't, we feel, hey, if I can hold on tight to this thing, if I can try to muster in all of my human wisdom and try to hold this together, maybe I can kind of just make it work. And the Bible tells us there's a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. Why? Because it's apart from Father God. But when we are surrendered to Him, man, he flows, he absolutely flows, but we don't wanna do it because we're controlled by fear and that's why, but God has not given us a spirit of fear. We don't operate in that, we shouldn't operate in that, that's not the way that we're designed. We're meant to live, I, I, I think of Adam and Eve and it was like, hey, go, take dominion, go, explore, just enjoy, enjoy my creation. Man, living in fear is so far from enjoying, isn't it? But that's exactly where the enemy wants us to be because if he can control us by fear, being controlled by something is not being surrendered to God. The only thing that you should be controlled by is the word of God. If you're controlled by anything other than God's word, than Holy Spirit flowing through you, then man, we are in a lot of trouble. We're in a lot of trouble. But it's so, it's so much comes through fear and that's why worry and fear and anxiety and stress and all this stuff just absolutely destroys our body. It's because we were designed with a different purpose. But when we come to him, we release our burden. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And he takes all of this and he puts on all of him. And he's saying, man, but, but, and I, and I know we know that. And I know we talk about that a lot that like, man, it, it's, it's God. He's great. Like, man, he created everything. We should just, just let go and let God. I mean, we get keychains about it. We put posters up, we get bumper stickers, but to actually live it is what it's all about. You can get all the bumper stickers you want. You can get all the t-shirts you want. You can do, I mean, you can get it tattooed on your body. It doesn't mean it's in your heart. We need to live it. It's the fruit. A dead tree doesn't produce fruit. A tree in, in his water, in his living water, flowing from him, pulling from him. And I'm telling you today, if, if your tank just feels empty and it just, it's because you've been driving on roads you were never meant to drive. But you get in him and it's like the Samaritan woman. It's like, man, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you water that you'll never thirst again. You'll never thirst again. You know, but if God would just handle my circumstance, if God would just handle my situation, if he would just, if he would just change what's going on, if he would just bail me out of this, then I'd be good. No, you wouldn't. Because it's the foundation of who you are that's causing what's going on. Because here's the deal, that if God just takes the problem and moves it, and it, then all of a sudden, then we have no foundation. Because it, it's all about the, the, the problem. The problem. It's what we allow inside of us. This going on out here. It was never the wind and the waves that sank Peter. It was when he got his focus on it. It was in a sense when he allowed the wind and the waves to get inside of him. And so we want God just to change the circumstances and God's like, no, I wanna change you because if you're only as good as your circumstances, then I will only be as good as your circumstances are going. 
But if I am truly God in your life because of who I am, then no matter the circumstances, you're founded on me and you'll never go down. And so that, that brings us with surrender. And I want to look at I want to look at Matthew 16 here real quick. And, and, and I and I, I'm gonna hop over to Joshua 7 and listen to this. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 16. And he's talking to, to Peter, and and uh, you know, this is when he's talking about his church, and this is in a sense Peter's revelation of Christ. Who do you say I am? You're anointed one, you're the son of the living God. You know, and this is when Jesus says that I give you the name Peter Stone and this rock will be the bedrock foundation on which I will build my church and the power of death will not be able to overpower it. I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that's that which is released in heaven. This is the promise that God just spoke out, that Jesus just spoke out over, in a sense, over Peter in that moment, over his disciples and over us. It, it was a declaration. It was a promise that was set forth, you know, but He's saying, but, but, but here's the deal. It's going to come through surrender. Because a little later in the chapter, Jesus then said to his disciples, if you truly want to follow me, look, this is great. This is awesome. But it comes from following me. You, got, you have to surrender. And he says this, if you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your own life, what does that sound like? Surrender, completely letting go, completely letting go. And you must be willing to share, nobody likes this part, share my cross and experience it as your own. It's like, well, I don't know. I mean, God, I want the blessing. I want the, I want the add all things unto me, but man, when I seek you, when I surrender, I have to let go, and it makes me feel incredibly uncomfortable. The cross was incredibly uncomfortable, wouldn't you say? It was incredibly uncomfortable. But I'm telling you what, when we get into that place, it says experience it as your own, as you continually surrender to my ways, oh, but this is so good. For if you choose self-sacrifice and lose your lives for my glory, you will continually discover true life. He's saying, man, all of me will open up and flow in you and through you. All of me in all of you. But we have to take that step to say, okay, okay, I'm letting go. I, I'm gonna let go. And God, what are, we, what are we doing? I'm not gonna trust myself anymore. I'm gonna trust you. It's hard because we've been hurt, we've been let down, we've been deceived. So many different ways. And we take our life experiences and we put them on Father God and what we should do is that we should take his experience through his son and put it on us. We shouldn't look at things through the lens of our failures and our faults. We need to look at everything through the lens of Jesus. And in that moment, he says, because, but if you choose to keep your lives, if you choose to hold on, if you choose to try to do it in your own strength, you will forfeit what you try to keep. You will forfeit what you try to keep. Look over here in Joshua 7. I'm in the Passion Translation, and this is huge. And I thought that this was absolutely powerful. There is so much um, in the book of Joshua. It is, it is just amazing. But here they just, they came into Jericho. They just saw an amazing victory at Jericho. And then Achan chose to do something that God told them not to do. 
he, he stole things, treasures that were devoted to God. And all of a sudden, it says the Israelites violated the commandment regarding the wealth of Jericho. Look here in Matthew 16, this, he's saying, if you violate my commandment of letting go, you'll lose everything you try to keep. You hop way back, it's the same principle. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same since before he created time. And he will be the same even after time. That's why these principles, when you look through the lens of Jesus, that, that's, why, that's why it just falls into line from the very first sentence to the very last sentence. That's why it falls into line. But listen to Achan, if, it lines, I mean, it's, it's on point. God really knew what he was doing when he wrote this. He really did. Get this, so this is Achan's sin, and, I, and, I, and this is so amazing to me because here's Joshua that sent out spies. What did they do with Moses when they were going into the promised land? They sent out spies, right? And the first report into the promised land was fear, and that's why they didn't go. It's like, oh, wait a minute, there's giants in the land. It was out of fear. And this, they sent out spies, and when they, rep when they returned to Joshua, they reported him, there is no need to trouble the whole army that conquered Ai. There's no need. It's small. It's little. They had one victory, and all of a sudden, they got all caught up in themselves. The first report was out of fear. Now, this report was out of arrogance, and both, and both fear and arrogance are both self centered pride itself, not surrender. And here they were in this moment, ah, there's no need. So Joshua only sent 3,000 men. And then all of a sudden, AI fought back and, and they killed 36 of Joshua's men. And when Israel heard of their defeat, their hearts melted away with fear. Is fear from the kingdom? No. They were focused on themselves, not on surrender. That all of a sudden they were allowing something other than the word of God to be forefront in their lives. And what did God do? He spoke to Joshua and he said, stand up. Why are you groveling before me? Knock it off, right? Stop having your pity party. Stop putting your focus on yourself. Stop being just all up in you and I want you to be all up in me. I don't want yourself, I want surrender. And he's saying, look, cursed things are among you. That is why Israel is powerless, has retreated from their enemies and in danger of annihilation. Tell them, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel says. Oh Israel, you have in your midst, now put this in our own lives today. You have this in your midst what must be devoted entirely to me. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove the devoted things from your midst. You cannot stand against the enemy. You cannot see the kingdom of God unfold in your life even though the total price has been paid. It's all been paid for us. We cannot see the full just kingdom unfold in our lives until we let go of us because when we are holding on to us, God can't fill hands when we're holding on to something. He's saying, look, put that down. Now I can go to work. It has nothing to do with his love. He loves you so much that he sent his one and only son. He loves you more than you could ever know. He already paid your price. That's not the deal. It's not that he doesn't love you. It's not that, not, not that he didn't pay the total price and take care of the sin debt, but how much of the flow are you going to open up in your life of what he's already paid for? We control that aspect. And I think it's so powerful that he has given us that free will to either say yes or no, to either say self or surrender because that's what makes it love and that's what makes it powerful because in this moment how many things are we holding on to when God said I want you to be a living sacrifice I want you to be completely devoted to me but what are you holding on to I want you to be you're holding on to things 
And until you remove the devoted things, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's family, maybe it's something with finances, maybe it's something with your health, maybe it's something that you've been holding on to from your past, a hurt, a care, a concern. Maybe it's something that's there that's saying, look, I want you to surrender that and all of you to me. But here's the deal. I can't get all of you until you let go of this over here. And I'm calling it, I paid the price for it. It is. I've told you to devote it to me, to cast all your cares on me. And when you do that, then all of a sudden you can step forward into me and watch what I can do in and through your life. It's amazing. It's amazing. But he's saying, look, he's saying you cannot stand against the enemies until you remove the devoted things from your midst. And so he called him forward. He did all this kind of stuff. He said, I'm going to separate them out. And it says, and Yahweh will indicate which family must come forward. This is amazing. One by one. Then finally, Yahweh will expose the man. He will expose the man caught with the devoted things which must be destroyed by fire. Get this. Look what Jesus said. If you let go of your life, for me, you will continually discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourself, you will forfeit what you try to keep. Here's Achan, that buried treasure and everything else in his tent. And it was violating God's word and what he had spoken to them. Don't touch it. Don't do it. Then all of a sudden, here, here it is. God lines it out and it's saying that, and then finally, Yahweh will expose the man caught with the devoted things which must be destroyed by fire. Everything that man owns, you must likewise destroy by fire. He didn't get to keep it. His family didn't get to keep it because it says, for he violated the covenant of Yahweh and committed an outrageous act in Israel. I was saying, no, no, no. You, you, you need this pruning. You need it. If you try to do it, see, if you try to do it you, on your own, you're, just, you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose all of this stuff. And, and in Hebrews 12, I, I believe it's that line because it says being destroyed by fire. You're gonna destroy it all by fire. And here's in Hebrews 12 where it says that, wait a minute, that, that God is an all-consuming fire. He's all-consuming. I have so many Bibles, I don't even know which one to go to. Here it is. It says, so only what is unshakable, this is the difference. Does the word have integrity within you? Does it have integrity within you? Are you undivided when it comes to God's word? The Israelite army was divided and that's why they were in fear. David was undivided because, and he, and he ran forward in faith. He ran forward in faith and I, I, this is so key. So only what is unshakable will remain. Man, the Israelites were shaken, but only what is unshakable will remain. Since we are receiving our rights to an unshakable kingdom, we should be extremely thankful and offer to God the purest worship. Worship isn't just songs. It's a great way to do it. It's an attitude of the heart. It's a lifestyle. We must offer to God the purest worship that delights his heart as we lay down our lives in absolute surrender I love how this puts it, filled with awe. When we are in surrender, we are filled with awe of who he is. But get this, for our God is a holy, devouring fire. He is a consuming light. We want the purity in the blessing, but we don't want the fire. We don't want the surrender of letting go. And I asked this last week, what does surrender in your life look like to you? What, what is it, what does surrender in your marriage look like, in your finances, in your family, in your health, in your plans, your dreams? What does surrender look like? And I looked up this definition of surrender, and this is actually pertaining to insurance, but I thought about this, about, man, we have insurance in Jesus, it's amazing. It says, to cancel one's policy what we were born into in Adam, the policy that we had through Adam, which is death, okay? To cancel one's policy and receive back the premium paid. That is so good. To cancel what I had in Adam 
and to receive back. I love how the premium paid. Christ was the premium paid for me and for you. And my old self in Adam is canceled. It is dead. It is gone. It's not in existence anymore. And I get to put back, I receive back the image that Adam and Eve were originally created into with Father God inside of them. I received back the premium paid because when Christ died on the cross, man, he paid it all. And he not just, yeah, he paid our sin debt. He paid for our, our earthly sickness and disease, but I think it's so Beautiful that through it all, he placed his image, Father God's image, back inside of us. So we are now complete and we are now whole. The premium has been paid back to us, baby. That's what I'm talking about. That's so good. And I believe that's all, that, that it's a consuming fire. What is that? A consuming light. What, what happens when you're consumed? You're immersed. You're not consumed by something if you just have your foot in the water. No, you're completely immersed. I think about this. I, I've done this. It's, it's probably not good to admit, but it's like when you're driving somewhere and your mind is completely immersed on something else and you leave point A and you get to point B and you're like, how'd I get here? I hope I used all my turn signals and I didn't go over the speed limit. I mean, I didn't get pulled over, so apparently I was okay, or at least no cops were sitting alongside the road. <laughs> but how many of you have been in that point where your brain has just been so immersed in something? You know, and I think about that in life that we get there so much that, man, <laughs> When, when, when there's something that we love to do or, or something maybe that's, that's going on at work or a project that we have to finish, you know, a, a, even, and especially like a hobby or something that you love to, love to do, every waking moment, we, we, we research it, we study it, we look into it, we try to become better in an area or try to give it all of our time and all of our devotion. And, and I, I took Milo driving golf balls couple weeks ago and he's just kind of getting into it a little bit and he just loves hockey and I'm like, hey man, this is kind of like hockey. He's just swinging, boom, there you go. You know, and we go there and there's these two older guys that came over real sweet and they kind of gave him like a few like little lessons, but I'm like, man, like, is this all you do with your time? You know, it's like, must be great to be retired. I don't know. And not there yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm thinking like, it's like, man, like, we immerse ourselves in work and culture and activities <laughs> All, all for what purpose? Personal gain on some level. And while we're busting our butts to thrive in an area, I think of students that I've talked to over the years being a youth pastor that, well, if I don't do this, if I, don't, if I, if I miss my games on Sundays or do this over here, then, then I, I won't be seen by the scouts and I won't, how many, you know, you, you know what, you can try to open that door in your own effort. You can try. It might work out Okay. You know, I, I believe a lot of people with adults, it's like they try to do the same thing with jobs. You know, try to work out those things in their own strength. Well, if I, if I don't work Sundays, if I don't do this, if I don't, if, I don't, if I don't consume my time with this over here, I'll never be able to pay my bills or I won't get that raise that I'm looking for. And I, and I think of that to where it, it's all, it, 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 I'm all for hard work, but I can't do things in my own strength because here's the deal. It's like, I've told these students, it's like, you know what, your plan might work out, it might not. And if it does work, you know, it might just be okay. And I think a lot of it's because it's a natural door. But the one thing I do know, that God can open doors that you can never and will never open on your own. That's what I do know. I don't know if your own plan that you're trying to do in your own strength by immersing yourself into that, I don't know if it's gonna work out or not, but I know his plan always does and he can open doors of promotion and influence in a mere moment that we couldn't even open in a lifetime. And I have proof of it because when Jesus turned water into wine, man, that was amazing, absolutely amazing that this, that this product that took years and years and years in a sense, a lifetime 
to perfect that was here, that was great, that was wonderful. All of a sudden, Jesus did in a moment with these people because it was like, wait a minute, the best came out now? Jesus went over and above what they put their entire lives into in their own strength. He went above and beyond just in a moment. And there is nothing wasted in your life. You might think, well, I've wasted all these years. I, I didn't follow God here and I didn't follow the God there. You know, I've wasted the past 30 years of my life. You know what? God doesn't waste anything. Again, in that moment, he can do more in a mere moment than what you could have done in the past 30 years. Give it to God. Allow God to turn that moment around in your life. Allow God to take this moment now and don't live in regret just like Tabitha. Well, I'm just, I'm looking at the stuff that she made before this was wonderful everything else no 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 when Jesus walks into the room he walked into your life let him take control don't see things the way that they were in the time that was wasted just see the kingdom of God flowing in through your life now and changing a city changing your family changing the relationships around you man so good he did in a mere moment what we couldn't do in a lifetime in a mere moment but it takes that surrender, and I believe that we surrender when we immerse ourselves in the word. The James 4.10, it says, humble yourself. Humble yourself. You don't want God to humble you. I don't want to be in that position. And then so you say, humble yourself before God, and he will exalt you. But you got to humble yourself. What do we do? We surrender and we immerse, seek first the kingdom. Immerse yourself in my kingdom and all other things will be added unto you. Immerse yourself, you surrender. Humble yourself, you surrender. And then seek first the kingdom. You surrender by immersing yourself in the word of God, by allowing the word to become all that you are. You are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your spirit man is brand new, but then you get into the word and all of a sudden your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, that, that link between, in a sense, the spirit man and the natural, all of a sudden it becomes transformed to think more like God than then this world, and all of a sudden, you just see the kingdom open up and flow through you in a way that you never thought possible. It's awesome. It's so good. But humble yourself, surrender, and then seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. Doesn't see, seek second, not even one and a half. Seek first the kingdom. Why well, do my two minute devotionals every day? I'm good. What if you only charged your phone two minutes a day? Some of you would be freaking out because you can't go on social media or play Candy Crush or whatever it is you guys do these days, you kids do these days. Ah, oh, my battery's low again. Uh, how would that work out? How would that work out? I love this Ezekiel 47. I believe it's such a perfect example of what it means to immerse says this, that he walked to the east with a measuring tape and he measured off 1,500 feet, leading me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another 1,500 feet, leading me through the water that was knee deep. Uh-oh, getting higher. He measured off another 1,500 feet, leading me through the water waist deep. Some of you are starting to panic. He measured off another 1,500 feet. By now, it was a river over my head water to swim in, water no one could possibly work through. God, it's too deep for me. God, it's too deep. And he's like, ha ha, good. Good. Because now you're immersed in me. Now you're worse. You're immersed in me. And I think about this, you know, like if, my, if I'm not immersed, if, my, if I'm a vessel and I'm dry, not only does that affect me, but if I'm dry, I can't dis distribute what I was meant to carry to other people. I'm meant to be immersed so that my vessel is always full. That way, I can always pour out, pour out when someone else needs a drink. And see, what's amazing is when I'm immersed in him, when I'm in his river of life, when I'm immersed in he. I'm not even pouring it out of me anymore. I'm pouring it out of the overflow coming from me. Out of your bellies will flow rivers 
a living water. It doesn't say that you gotta make the rivers flow. You just gotta get in his river. When we immerse God and I, I it's, it's so powerful. It is so powerful. Because if we're gonna be immersed in something, some of us are immersed in news and media and um, hobbies and whatnot. We're gonna be immersed in something and that something is going to fill our vessel. It's going to. So I need to make sure that it's God's river and not the river of this world. If I'm gonna be full of something, if something is gonna fill me, I better make sure that I'm putting the right gas in the tank. You know? I think of the, I, I wrote this, the power of water. I, I mean, you look at the flood, look at Noah and, and the flood and how water just completely shaped the earth in such an amazing way. I don't, I don't really listen to the scientists and all the weird things. I, I just don't. You can't all you want. And keep being wrong, it's fine. But uh, it's just a little joke, that was fun. But I, I just, man, like I, I just love to dive into creation. We watch uh, like creation videos and all that stuff with our kids. And, and I think of the power of water and how it molds and it shapes in such an amazing way. And, and I was watching this thing to where like a flood came through to where, um, you know, they just had, they had like a hundred times the amount of whatever the rain, rainfall is for a year, they had like a hundred times that in like an hour. And it just washed things away, cars flowing down the street. We saw things with like tsunamis and everything else, how it just wipes everything out. The power of water is absolutely amazing. And I wrote this down. We don't have the power over the shaping he molds and he shapes us in, the, in a sense. Something molds and shapes us. We don't have the power over the shaping, but we do have the power to choose what will shape us. I think in this moment, with David as he walked on the battlefield. He was surrendered his life to Father God and he immersed himself. Oh God, you're my shepherd. I don't need a single thing in this world because I have you. And through this moment, through this humbling, through this surrender and through, <laughs> through this just immersing himself in Father God, I think of two main things that it allowed him to do. And through the immersion, he became equipped. And I think of that real quick. We got, we got like three minutes here and I apologize last week. And actually, it, I did go a little long. Um, but the clock was fast, okay? They fixed it this week. They fixed it. They fixed it. I felt bad. I've, I apologized to Pastor Elaine. I said, hey, I don't, um, I'm sorry I went over. But I said, what, like, take responsibility, but the clock was wrong, so they fixed it. So I'm gonna just go over on purpose tonight. No, I'm, I'm just gonna take just a quick minute, just a quick minute, because this is amazing, is that when you're immersed in God's word, it equips you to do exactly what God has called you to do, okay? Because here was David that stepped up against Goliath, that he steps into Saul's tent, and Saul tries to put his armor on him and he tries to equip him and, and Saul's trying to put the world on him in a sense. He's trying to put the world's way on him and, and David's like, he said he took a few steps, he tried to move and he's like, I'm not used to this, I can't do this. How much should that be us that in a sense when the world tries to put itself on us, we're like, no, we don't like this, I'm, I'm out. You know, when the world tries to put us in their mold, it's like, no, I, I don't belong here. This is... It, this doesn't feel right. I don't want anything to do with it. I just get it off me. You know, we should, we should, we should be like that. It's like, I, I don't, I, that doesn't belong around me. You know, and he steps up and he's like, wait a minute, I, 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 I've been immersing myself in Father God. I've been immersing myself with, with worship and this, this doesn't feel right. And what does he do? He goes to the stream to where the power of water 
shaped and smoothed those stones. He picked up smooth stones that the power of water came through, that the river of God, in a sense, the living river of God, smoothed off the rough edges, and he was able to equip himself, not with the things of this world, but with, with exactly who he was called to be. In a sense, he, was, he equipped himself with smooth stones from the streams in John 7, rivers of living water. And I believe that even when he was down there, he was, he was, he was picking up these rocks. And he's like, I'm thinking like Psalm 118. It's like, you know, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love and his mercy endures forever. Oh, let all of God's people. Hey, that, I'm, I'm God's people. Hey, awesome. Let, let, us, let us remember and sing praise. Ah, that his love and his mercy endures forever. And I believe in that moment that his mind wasn't concerned about, can I beat this guy? Can I not beat this guy? His mind was on the promise of God. Father, thank you that you have equipped me for this moment, that I am taking these smooth stones shaped by you, that I am putting, and it says that he walked out with the stones and a shepherd's staff, and I thought about that. That was so huge that I, I believe that was key that he walked on there because they weren't just physical weapons in the natural that he was used to. He was carrying memorials of what God did for him in his time of worship. He was carrying the shepherd's staff. He was carrying the, the stones. He was skilled with the sling. He was carrying those things. And he was looking as he ran out on the battlefield to see Goliath. He ran out and he was like, God, you, you've delivered me every single day of my life. And I remember these things, I had them with me. Not, you know what, that, 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 that bear and those things. Hey, yeah, that was wonderful. You delivered me from that. Oh, but God, I remember the worship that I had in you. I remember laying my sling and my staff down and getting before you as I surrendered those things to you, as I put those natural things in your hands, just like Jesus did with the loaves and the fish, that he took the natural elements in that moment, just like we do with communion, to where we take the natural elements in the moment and we take the natural and we put it into the supernatural and it comes back kingdom. And he's saying, look, I'm gonna take this staff and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna take these rocks, Father, and I'm there, God, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Father, I'm putting these in your hands because man, who you have blessed, no man can curse. You've given me a promise. Oh, I'm a new creation in you. I am righteous. I am redeemed. I am made new. All my sin is gone. My debt's been paid. My old man is gone. I am made new in you. That's what we should be saying as New Testament believers. As we put the natural down, oh, I believe he's sitting there. And all of a sudden, when he ran on that battlefield, it was a symbol, it was a testament to his worship and his faithfulness of God. That's what he was equipped with. And that's what we need to be equipped with is, is that testimony and that testament of God's faithfulness. And what do we do? It says that he ran out toward Goliath. And as Goliath taunted him and said, who is this little dog that you bring out me? And he's saying, you come at me at sword, with sword and a spear. He, and David said, but I come at you. He didn't say with a rod and with a slingshot. He said, I come at you with the word of God. That's what I'm coming with. And it's gonna come through these stones. It's gonna come through this rod. It's even gonna come through what you meant for harm against me with your sword. I'm gonna pick up your sword and I'm gonna cut off your own head with it. Because what the enemy means for harm, ha ha. And we are equipped with it. And he ran out to battle. He was surrendered. He was immersed. He was equipped. And then with confidence in his God, with confidence in our God, we run onto that battlefield. And it's not, it's not for me to be, I hope I win this. It's not for me to prove anything. No, no, no. It's to prove what he's already done. It's not to enforce me. It's to enforce him in the kingdom. It's not to say, can I win this? No, no, no. I'm not walking on the battlefield questioning. I'm walking on the battlefield to enforce the victory that heaven already paid for. And I believe this. Goliath was taunting them for 40 days and they cowered in fear. And David was like, no, 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 no. You don't stand a chance. And I, I, just, I just want to end with this tonight. 
Thank you for your patience. I'm not preaching next week, so you're all right. What has been standing taunting you? And I wanna tell you that it's been long enough and it's time that we step up and step into who God has called us to be. And I read this quote from Bill Johnson. He's the pastor of Bethel Church in Reading. It's amazing. It's just not a quote, it's just a story that's there, but they, they have determined within their church, and I'm telling you, I'm declaring that here at Word of Life in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, that they were, they were battling as a church that their church will be a cancer-free zone. And I'm declaring that, that we are a city on a hill. We have the answers. We have the life. We step into Tabitha's room and we raise the dead because that's who we're called to be. But I will not cower to fear and I will not run away. And even when, I, when it seems that I don't have my answer in that moment, I step forward and I continue to walk in his purpose. And I'm telling you, it's time that we become undivided for the kingdom that we surrender and that we immerse ourselves in him. We have to give the things that he has called to be devoted to him. He has called us to his own. He has called us completely, entirely. He has called us to be his own and it's time that we surrender and that we immerse ourselves, that we equip ourselves with the word and who God has called us to be and we run on that battlefield and we enforce the victory of the kingdom and watch the kingdom unfold in our lives in a way that we never thought possible. It's so good. Let me bless you as we leave. Father, I thank you so much. You are amazing, God, and we love you. We love you. We love you. And oh, we love you because you first loved us. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for your victory that's here tonight, Father. And I pray that a new mindset is established here tonight. That, Father, that this word will go down deep in each and every heart and produce 30, 60, 100 fold that it will not return void, but it will accomplish all that it was set forth to do. And we thank you, Father. I bless your people in the name of Jesus. Amen. Were you thank you again for joining us. We pray you are blessed and encouraged by today's service, and we invite you to join us again next week. Our services go live every Sunday at 9 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and at wordoflife.church. We also meet in person every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. If you would like to know more about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus, please reach out to us. We have some incredible resources that we would love to share with you, and they'll encourage you and teach you more about God's goodness and his great plans for your life. If God is using our church to change your life and you would like to help us lead people to life in Jesus by giving, you can do so by visiting wordoflife.church give or you can text the amount you would like to donate to 84321. Follow along with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube if you would like to know more about what God is doing in and through Word of Life Church. Thank you for helping us lead people to life in Jesus. We love you, God loves you, and we are so thankful that you chose to spend time with us today.